And I think now the others are looking towards is a way to do business without uh, being vulnerable to the U.S. coming in and freezing accounts or dictating who can do what to whom. The U.S. absolutely, in my view, wrongly, even disastrously militarized the dollar. It said you can use the dollar, you can't use the dollar, you think those are your foreign exchange reserves. No, we locked them up. The United States, after all, started uh, in 2022 in its sanctions against Russia by freezing $300 billion of Russia's accounts. It also did something completely weird in my view. And so lawless, I can't even could not have imagined it, which is to say, you're a friend of Putin, you no longer have your apartment, you're a friend of Putin, you no longer have your house. Anyway, it's bizarre that this is even a contemplated, much less done to a lot of people. Uh, but in any event, the U.S. froze the balances of multiple countries. The Forex balances foreign exchange reserves uh, and not only Russia. Venezuela was a unique situation. One day, the Trump administration declared, Mr. Maduro, you're no longer president. Juan Guaido is the president. How did they determine that? Because they simply asserted it. So we, are, we create our own reality. And bizarrely enough, on that basis, the United States froze Venezuela's own money. So what's happening right now is countries saying, are we doing this, especially countries that you know might have a foreign policy disagreement with the United States and don't want to see their economy tanked. So the essence of what they're looking for is how to make settlements that don't go through U.S. banks and therefore that are not subject to the U.S. regulatory reach to freeze a payment. As a monetary economist, my view is this is not very hard. You can settle in multiple ways. Uh, and this is the point that they're all making in the BRICS summit which is why should India and Russia or China and Brazil settle in dollars and be vulnerable to the U.S. Treasury, uh, to CFIUS, to all of these committees that one day to the next can say, that's not really your money. They desire a dependable payment system, and I believe they will come up with one in the coming year. They will settle in renminbi. They will settle in rubles. They will settle in rupees, and they may make a unit of account that's based on perhaps the starting five. Our currencies, the ruble, uh, the real, uh, the rupee, uh, the renminbi, and the rand. So it happened that the five original BRICS countries are all currencies, and they talk about a five-hour unit of account. Now, they've added the real uh, with Saudi Arabia and with Iran, so maybe it'll be seven hours in the core basket. It won't be a currency. Uh, it may be a unit of account uh, for denomination of contracts and so forth. They could then very well create swap lines across the central banks of the BRICS countries. I would imagine that they would do so to ensure liquidity in this system, just like the SDR can be issued ex nihilo out of nothing in the MAF, which basically means that central banks agree to swap their currencies on the sense the same can happen within the BRICS countries. What they will do in short is to create alternative payments mechanisms that don't use U.S. banks' great success for the U.S. They brought it on themselves, absolutely predictably. My view is the role of the dollar is going to diminish tremendously. The whole economics literature says no, this doesn't happen. This will take decades. No, this will happen quickly because of the politics. I'll, I don't mean one year to the next, but over the next few years, it'll happen for two fundamental reasons. One is that the U.S. militarized the, the dollar. And the second is that because of digital technologies, the ways to work around even the banking system and straight digital settlements is absolutely clear right now. So the mechanics of creating a non-dollar transaction system, I think, 
is much, much better technologically than even five years ago. The other thing I go to say, because, you know, I, I think this needs to be said, is that none of this, you said that what's happening to the dollar is not in the interest of the United States. In my view, none of these actions are beneficial for the United States. The United States is subordinating the prosperity of its own people to the geopolitical objectives that it has to sustain its own hegemony. And I should say, just before we did this program, I was reading two articles that you sent us, both written by, well, I mean, they're summaries of articles of the, the people who were on the Council for Foreign Relations, and they talk about revitalizing the U.S. economy in order to meet the challenge from China. And I have to say, that seems to me an absolutely warped sense of priorities. You don't revitalize your economy in order to meet the challenge from China. If you're going to revitalize your economy, you do it in order to increase the prosperity, the happiness, the sense of contentment in your own country amongst your own people. Uh, that is the mindset that these people seem to have. They subordinate everything to their geopolitical ideas. It's so well said, Alexander. You know, the main problem in the United States is we have become a plutocracy, massive inequality, a lot of people suffering, and no one pays any attention to that. That's not the Republicans, not the Democrats, period. So even when they, quote, revitalize the U.S. economy in the Biden fashion, what are they doing? It's more corporate tax cuts for everything. So everything is basically, we'll give tax cuts for uh, building semiconductors. We'll give tax cuts for renewable energy, whatever it is. However, the entire way of operating is influenced by corporations from top to bottom. So we're just exacerbating the inequalities and the real telltale point of all of this is not the GDP, it's life expectancy, which has been falling for a decade in the United States. Now we're back to the life expectancy of the mid 1990s. People in the United States are ill. They're not getting taken care of. They don't have access to decent nutrition. They don't have access to healthcare services. That's not even on the agenda. What's on the agenda? The war in Ukraine, Taiwan, weaponry, fighting China. So you put it exactly right. Was Yellen's visit really about asking China not to dump treasuries? How did the U.S. expect it to succeed after Biden insulted Z? What leverage does the U.S. have to make it happen? Of course, I don't know what was said in the room. I've known our Treasury Secretary for 50 years because in 1973, 50 years ago, I sat in a classroom when a wonderful young professor from Yale came and taught me macroeconomics. So I go back 50 years with Janet Yellen, and she's a very decent and wonderful person. The, the message that she carries comes from an administration that I am not very sympathetic to. And my advice to this administration was, if you go to say we're not out to undermine your economy, the first thing you should say is, we will not impose more unilateral measures before we negotiate with you. In simpler terms, my recommendation was to cease acting unilaterally. Unfortunately, it seems the advice was not heeded as shortly after Secretary Yellen's visit, President Biden issued a new executive order restricting more technology exports to China. So the message that Secretary Yellen carried, that we're not aiming to derail, we don't want to decouple and so forth, whatever it was, it was undermined immediately afterward by the actions of the Biden administration which took yet another step to try to undermine China. And however much they say, we're not trying to undermine China. Of course, they're trying to undermine China. It's plain as can be. And so they should stop that if they want to have actual normal relations with China. The first thing you do is stop putting on unilateral measures 
and start really talking, not in one trip, but in actual discussion and negotiation. And that doesn't happen till this day. The Biden administration came in and whether it is the neocon ideology, which is pervasive with Biden, whether it was fear of Trump that he won the Midwest states with an anti-China protectionist election platform, probably both of those Biden came out blazing anti-China and also a point that Alexander made and I think should be reiterated, trash talking is nonstop about China. So Secretary Yellen goes soon after President Biden says, well, President Xi is a dictator. Come on. Or bad things happen to bad people. You know, this is also Biden. He's kind of gotten a really obnoxious side. And he thinks that he's real tough when he's speaking to the donors to show how macho he is. So these are all stupid statements coming out of the donor sessions. And Biden always likes to swagger. Uh, an 80-year-old guy swaggering in this pathetic way is really pathetic. But it's trash talk. I don't have knowledge of the specific discussions that took place, but I can say that it's unlikely for any form of regular relations to succeed when dealing with this type of one-sided conduct. And it's amazing, as I was just rereading one of the articles by the Council on Foreign Relations, which says, in this sense, there is no real prospect of building fundamental trust, peaceful coexistence, mutual understanding, uh, strategic partnership, or a new type of major country relations between the U.S. and China. There's the corrected version of the text with proper commas and full stops, rather, the most that can be hoped for is caution and restrained predictability. In other words, the U.S. position always is we don't want to have trust. We don't want to have anything. We don't necessarily want to have war. Uh, sometimes they do, but it's going to be bad. You know, we're going to be tough. I've been saying the idea of fundamental trust or peaceful coexistence, don't even think about it. That's the real American attitude. Don't have a real discussion with Chinese counterparts. The West is hurting China by going belly up and no longer being able to buy Chinese exports. The problem is China has not been able to substitute U.S. demand. What do you think about that statement? Well, it's not that the West can't buy Chinese exports. It stopped because of high tariffs and barriers and threats to U.S. companies and warnings. Don't go there and don't produce goods in China for resale to the U.S. market and so forth. So the concept is to reduce the demand for Chinese products, putting China in a situation similar to Japan's crisis in the past. In response, China would need to explore other markets and the world is vast with opportunity. That is what China is doing, which is saying, OK, we are not going to beg to get into a U.S. market for a country that evidently can't even think about peaceful coexistence. We have to find our way in the world. And what China is doing is forging economic cooperation with most of the rest of the world. And most of the rest of the world means ASEAN countries in Southeast Asia. It means African countries. It means West Asia, the Gulf countries. It means Central Asian countries, the stands. It means South American countries. And China has several initiatives. The best known is the Belt and Road Initiative, which basically says we save a lot. The Chinese have a very high saving rate. We can provide finance for our partners, our counterpart countries, to really upgrade infrastructure, upgrade fast rail, for example, upgrade fiber.